I just, you know, encourage people to think about what your role is in improving or, you know, impacting an educational system close to you. It could be the one you attended, it could be the community that you live in. Um, but yeah, I definitely think everyone has a role to play when it comes to improving education. Hey there, and welcome back to Simbi Foundation's podcast, Impact in the 21st Century, the show that shares stories of positive impact in a world that right now can leave us all feeling a little helpless. Each episode, I speak with incredibly inspiring guests about the positive impact they're making, learning how they discovered their passion, and uncover what they've done to turn vision into action. I also aim to tease out what we can all do to lead more impactful lives, so be sure to stick around. I'm Aaron Friedland, your host of Impact in the 21st Century and founder of Simbi Foundation, a nonprofit organization that collaborates with the UN to build digital, solar powered classrooms called Bright Boxes to support the next 3.5 million learners in refugee settlements. If you're returning for another episode, thank you for being part of this community and for taking the time out of your day to listen to our podcast. You inspire us to keep sharing these impactful stories. And if this is your first time listening, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And if you enjoy this episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the awesome guest list we have lined up for you. And a huge thank you to RBC for sponsoring this episode. On the show today, how Shalane's one-year USAID contract led her to directing the Trevor Noah Foundation, and now what the Trevor Foundation are doing to empower learning in the 21st century. And Shalane, it is such a pleasure to have you with me. Thanks for taking the time to join today. Thank you for having me. I'm glad we were able to do this. So how does one go from moving to South Africa on a one-year contract as a USAID advisor to being the executive director of the Trevor Noah Foundation? Just help me understand the sequence of events that takes place to make that happen. Um, I mean, I'm so amazed that when I look back, I've been in South Africa for seven, almost eight years, and the plan was to be here for one. Um, but I think prior to getting that one year contract with USA, I think since I was 18 and left my house to go to college, um, in that next decade, I don't think I stayed in one place for more than a year. So when I was doing my four year undergraduate college degree, I split that up by studying abroad in Thailand. Um, I worked for a year and realized that it wasn't going anywhere. So I did my master's and I moved to New York. And even in between those two years, I spent the summer in Ghana and South Africa. Um, so all of those experiences led me to um, having the networks and confidence to move to South Africa after I finished my MPA, my master's uh, from, from NYU. Um, so when I got to South Africa, uh, my, my one year USAID contract I was with an organization called the South African Supplier Diversity Council, which is a mouthful, but we essentially um, supported Black-owned businesses and empowered them to, or empowered corporate South Africa to uh, incorporate more Black-owned businesses into their supply chain. Um, and I kind of dove right into Black economic empowerment policy. Um, I just got very involved in uh, the economic and social systems of South Africa. And I think as someone who enjoys a challenge and can't really sit back when it comes to socioeconomic uh, systems that you know oppress people. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to stay in South Africa. I enjoyed the work that I was doing, um, but I actually moved to Namibia for one year consulting for the Ministry of Home Affairs <laughs> with a private South African consulting firm before coming back into South Africa and, and doing something else. Um, but I think I'm one who enjoys change and I feel very comfortable with change. And so as I take a new opportunity, I meet people and I become interested, uh, further interested in a certain subject, which by the way, they're all interconnected, right? Whether I'm working to support black owned businesses or entrepreneurs or education, the underlying factors um, that people face as challenges are all the same. So it's not really me kind of shifting too much. It's more about um, how can I tackle the same problem from different angles. And so you returned to Namibia, uh, from Namibia to South Africa. And what events took place where, where you became the executive director of the Trevor Noah Foundation? Right. 
so after I came back from Namibia, I started working for another organization uh, that supports entrepreneurs. Um, but with my passion in the social sector, I wanted to support social entrepreneurs specifically. And so I actually consulted for myself for a while, uh, mm -hmm. supporting social entrepreneurs and guiding them through deciding whether to be a for-profit or a non-profit entity, supporting uh, non-profit entities with um, commercializing their activities so they're less reliant on donor funds. And through networks, um, a good friend of mine asked for my help in registering a nonprofit organization. And that nonprofit organization ended up being the Trevor Noah Foundation. So it was definitely right place at the right time. But I think with what I was doing um, and what I was passionate about and the networks I had built since my time in South Africa, um, I kind of jumped in and said, okay, cool. Now that I know it's for Trevor, what is he interested in? Kind of treating him as um, a client that I had worked, that I would have worked with. Um, so, you know, what's the organization's vision? Uh, what's the mission? What are the goals? Okay, how do we understand policy that influences what you can and can't do? Um, and so kind of just becoming a consultant on the project and heading, helping him set up the foundation. Um, we put together a strategy over you know, six months, did market research um, on the ground. And before you know it, I, I just became the right person to execute on that strategy, I suppose. So I executed on the strategy that we had made for the foundation. And that was three or four years ago. And it's kind of just snowballed into now being an organization with uh, a small but mighty team of five um, and we have global and local partnerships and, you know, we're involved in 11 schools and um, are also partnered with YALI on a program to empower teachers. So it's been a journey, um, but it's been one that has constantly evolved. And that's why, you know, as someone who I think gets bored quite easily and always chase, chases an evolving need, the foundation has allowed me to, to do that. And um, I'm very fortunate to have the leadership that I do above me, including Trevor, who, um, who yeah, we have just allowed this foundation to grow. That's incredible. And it sounds like such an amazing opportunity. So, you know, you're helping to set up this organization. It's early days and you're figuring out mission, vision, values. And you're, I mean, you're essentially in startup mode. And then you end up being the person to execute on that strategy. Yeah, and, and definitely uh, definitely thankful for the opportunity. Uh, I think there were some times in that process where, you know, imposter syndrome sets in. And you're like, I can't do this. I can't, do this. I can't run Trevor's foundation. Like, we know him and we know the icon that he is globally. Um, but yeah, it's just about, understanding that yes, it is an organization that carries Trevor's name. At the same time, it's an opportunity to make real change in children's lives, make real change in the educational system in South Africa, um, reinstill hope and a sense of stability in some of the schools that we work with. And so, yes, I think while it was very terrifying to kind of carry Trevor's name and all of the um, expectations that come with that. It's a huge opportunity, not just for me, but for what we can do with the brand. I think that's what excites me the most. So, you know, you're talking a little bit about early days and strategy in, in, in Trevor Noah Foundation. And I'm curious to hear some of what those early, you know, six month, one year strategies were. And then I'd love to learn more about what, what the strategies and the objectives are today, and ultimately what, what the foundation's vision for education um, in the future, in the 21st century actually looks like. Yeah. Um, so when we first started, you know, I think Trevor just wanted to make edu good education accessible to kids who didn't have a, a chance at receiving a good education. He wanted to really reach those kids. And so, you know, I took his direction and vision very literally. And um, the first school that we partnered with, they support orphans. So they have a designation called um, learners with special education needs. 
but the school we partnered with initially um, didn't have learning or physical disabilities, but they all um, lived in orphanages. And so they shared this common thread of, you know, not having family in the traditional sense. So either parents have passed away or the parents are based in another country. Um, and so that contributes to their challenges and getting a good education and succeeding thereafter. And so what we saw with the school and the reason why we decided to partner, partner with them was even though many of the kids face these incredible challenges at home, um, the pass rate was very, very high. And the principal had taken the pass rate from you know 14% at the end of the year to like low 90% over, you know, in his tenure. And so we were thinking and saying, you know, the school has a lot of potential, but what happens is many of the kids end up falling off after they graduate grade 12 or they matriculate. And then they go back into the cycle of poverty because there aren't any um, opportunities that they're accessing after matric. And I think for us, that's where we said, you know, we could really do something here. Um, there's a lot of potential. These kids are obviously very smart. They're performing well academically, but because of a lack of social capital, a lack of knowledge and information on what to do next and how to get there, um, that was something that we could assist. So our first goal became increasing the transition rate of our grade 12 students into further education or, or, um, or training. And so um, in order to do that, we brought in different partners and implemented programs at the school um, with the intention of, you know, not being there forever, but also increasing the capacity of the school so that they can take on these, these interventions themselves into the future. So we brought in initiatives such as psychosocial support so that now every single child had an access to a counselor or a therapist, um, career guidance, obviously, so that they understand what their options are and how to get there. Um, and then we also brought in a digital skills partner and set up a computer lab, um, training for teachers and learners so that they can actually participate. Not, not only, I mean, we're not even talking about excelling in the 21st century, but just being able to participate in the 21st century um, uh, learning. Right. Yeah, so that's what we did in our first year. Um, and it was very micro, one school, but I think we learned, we learned a lot. Uh, we learn a lot with regards to getting teacher buy-in, with how we work with partners, um, how we communicate our impact, and just all of the systemic barriers around the school that we wouldn't be able to change. Like we learned a lot about, um, because we were dealing with students, some students who weren't South African, and I'm sure you know a lot about this as well, but we dealt with a lot of kids who struggled with documentation issues and how a student who maybe moved to South Africa when they were you know, five or six, their parents passed away. And if they don't know where their father is, but if their father is listed on their birth certificate, that minor doesn't have the right to obtain a South African document without their parent, without the legal parent who they don't know where he is. Um, and without an ID, you don't qualify for scholarships. You can't apply to university. And if you, even if you do, you would have to pay exorbitant rates. You don't qualify for national student aid. So there are a lot of things that we learned, a lot of nuances. Um, and I think from there, when we scaled to new schools, we realized uh, we kind of changed our relationship and our approach in that we focused more on teachers. So I think programs that are direct to learners are great. But in terms of return on investment and our return on our level of, of effort, it made most sense to empower teachers as kind of the um, bearers of education. And we really want those programs to be institutional knowledge that stays with the, that stays with the schools. Um, and the best way to do that is to train the teachers on rolling out these programs and have the program sit with the teachers. The learners at the end of the day will still benefit, right? It's just about how we deliver those programs. Right. So I'll tell you, uh, Simbi Foundation works in uh, the Bidi Bidi refugee settlement in Uganda, and we work across India and other parts of Uganda as well. And I know that in the past we had launched initiatives. We, we build these solar power classrooms and uh, provide quite robust um, ed education and electricity to to the communities. And in our early days as well, it, it was very interesting um, to see interventions fail 
um, because there was lack of teacher buy-in or because there was lack of incentive or ultimately systems just simply weren't put in place correctly. Um, the, the, I guess the, the easiest example I can share is not providing educators with enough training for them to feel confident using the technology and, and building that behavior of usage in front of a classroom and essentially developing a full training program based on that to ensure that that doesn't happen. But I'm wondering, were there, were there any, you know, exciting ideas that you and Trevor had on a whiteboard and then you put them into practice and you realize this isn't working at all? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that we are still trying to figure out um, is how we approach um, assets. So uh, like putting computer labs into schools, we know that we wanna provide kids with assets, um, but I mean, given the circumstances in South Africa, you know, the first computer lab that we put into a school was completely stolen uh, right before uh, right after the right right after the the first lockdown, I can't even remember what month this was. It was last year sometime, like mm -hmm. June, July, during the first wave. Um, and about like one weekend before schools were reopening, the computer was completely the computer lab was completely wiped out. Um, so it's not just the monetary value of those assets, right? But it's a sweat equity of everyone invested. Ourselves, um, our uh, digital partners, Microsoft. Um, all of the intent, all of, you know, we had our launch at the school. So there are tons of photos from our launch event in this computer lab and now it's completely gone. Uh, and so I think with, with Trevor, we've tried to rethink how, like, what a physical lab looks like, you know, and you have to think down to the detail of um, uh, what kind of reinforcements are in the ceiling because people will come, you know, come through the ceiling and, and steal computers that way. So some schools actually have like a, uh, an iron like net in between the ceiling and the roof um, to prevent theft that way. Yeah, and I, I just think, you know, buying a physical asset and, and um, locking it up in its traditional sense is, I mean, that, that, that works in, in, in some cases, but in this case, it didn't work. So how do we, we rethink giving kids access to a physical device or, or maybe it looks completely different, you know? Um, not just what it is that you buy, but like how do you structure it in a room so that it's safe and that it's theft proof? Or right. flipping that conversation on its head, how do you reinforce relationships with communities so that um, there are more people who are bought in to those assets at that school and will help safeguard it? And that's kind of more of the approach that we've, we've taken now. So another shift that the foundation made is um, we are definitely more community driven. Uh, we have multiple projects going on in, in one school, but now we partner with multiple schools in one community. We have programs for unemployed youth in that community to help us maintain school assets. So the theory now is with greater buy-in in one community and more visibility of who we are, will you know, does the responsibility of safeguarding assets extend beyond just TNF, right? Hopefully it spills over into the greater community. So that's kind of the solution that we've taken, but um, yeah, we've definitely uh, failed. <laughs> you know, it's, it's humbling, but you have to, you have to go through the process of failing, I find. And, and what I mean by that is we, we actually arrived at a very similar model where initially the solar power classrooms that we build um, were simply providing electricity and, and educational resources. And then we realized, look, if there is community buy-in, um, if the community is incentivized to protect and maintain and sustain, there is a lower uh, theft, lower, ultimately your infrastructure depreciates at a slower pace. Um, and so what we did is we ended up equipping a full part of the solar power classroom with a cell phone charging room that is run by the community. We provide the training and the community get a percentage of those profits. And so, they're highly incentivized to protect and maintain and sustain the infrastructure. But it's interesting because if someone had told me at a lecture, hey, you need, you need to have a higher alignment of community 
interests, I would have said, oh yeah, okay, for sure. But you, you sometimes you need to go through that process to, to fully realize for yourself. For sure. Yeah. Um, and I, when people say community buy-in, it's a loaded term and it's a loaded approach, right? So I think so many times we speak to organizations where you try to understand the work that they do and the relationship they have with their, their community. And they'll just say, yeah, it's, it's great. You know, we include them in the, in the process. And I mean, and, and to what extent really varies and how you do it varies. Um, and along your process, the number of touch points you have with your community also varies. So yeah, I think community buy-in is definitely a loaded term. Um, and I mean, I'll share one example of, of where it was beneficial that I didn't anticipate. Um, but right now we're deeply in uh, a community called Brom Fisher, which is just outside of Soweto. And we partnered with, um, there are seven primary schools and one secondary school. The secondary school we've been working with for two or so years. And this year we shifted to expanding that partnership to the primary schools that feed into that secondary school. And before we did that, we actually had a town hall in Brom Fisher. To, and we invited all the primary schools and we you know, announced and said, you know, this is the foundation, this is what we do, this is our, these are our plans, um, you know, and we just arbitrarily budgeted for you know, five schools in one community. This is just how we, how we designed our financial model. And so only at that town hall did I learn that there are only seven schools, seven primary schools in Brown Fisher. And Thankfully so, one of the principals stood up and said, you know, if you have intent to only partner with four schools um, and, you know, we have an application process, we ask them to apply so that we, um, so that they demonstrate some buy-in, right? And so he was saying, you know, if you only choose four out of the seven schools, you will tear apart our community. And all of the primary schools in this community have a really great a uh, pre-existing collaborative relationship and don't you dare do that to our community. And so while I was very taken aback in the moment because I was like standing in front of everyone, um, like I will always remember that because now we have just slightly shifted our model to find a way to train all seven schools together. And it actually makes sense for us rather than having a school by school approach, all of the interventions we do now in Brown Fisher that involve the primary schools, we just do them all together. Um, and so we would have never known that had we not had that town hall and not put ourselves out there to introduce ourselves to the community. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm very, we're still very good friends with that principal, but I will always remember that. And I'm so thankful for him stepping up and letting us know. It, it's funny to me how many hilariously similar experiences we have clearly had in, uh, in, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, kudos for just putting yourself out there and being open to the learnings, right? I, I think th there's a great book on this, The White Man's Burden, and it's just why has so much development and aid failed? And a lot of the time, it's just because we're really bad at learning and we're really bad at asking the community, what do you genuinely need? And we're really good at giving tied aid and saying, hey, <laughs> we will give you this because this is what we have and we think you may want it. Um, but it... The, I remember being um, in zone one of Bitty Bitty refugee settlement. We just done an installation and the community or actually Joseph Asali, the, the head of UNHCR um, for this, uh, for Yumbe, which is this district says, hey guys, you know that this pilot has been fantastic. The solar power classrooms working great, but there are parents who now want to take their kids out of zone two or zone three to go to zone one to go to the school because it's tech enabled and thinking through exactly what you're saying with Bromfisher, right? If you essentially train four out of seven schools, the negative unintended consequences that are not thought through can be disastrous. And so it's just beautiful to hear that, that you're thinking about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine if we tore apart the community before we even started doing any work there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's not just what's bad for us and our, our brand, but I mean, yeah, to break the community in half before anything even happens. No, um, yeah, but I, I completely hear you. And I, I, I really wish that um, 
people were were I guess vulnerable enough to just get to that step sometimes. Um, yeah, and I, I well, and it's a it's a totally different complex for me because I'm not South African, right? Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that helps or hurts, but when I first came to South Africa, I actually um, always felt like I had an objective voice. Um, I was an objective person in the room. In some ways, it, it's 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 helpful because I think people are okay with talking honestly with me. And sometimes it's it's not okay because then you just appear as a, a, a fly on the wall and people ignore you altogether. Um, but I guess for my personality, um, to be able to come into a room where I can have an objective voice and an objective face. I think for me, it, it, it does help. Um, but yeah, I think becoming vulnerable is something that you just learn over time. And I'm still learning, um, you know? Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that journey ever ends, but there are many times where uh, I leave a room feeling like completely embarrassed or whatever it is. Um, but I don't know, it's, in some ways you have to kind of think beyond yourself, right? This conversation is not really about me. It's about you guys. And if I can help us get to where you want to go, then I'm going to do it. There you go. Yeah. And I think it's also just as, as leaders in, in your field and I guess in, in our field, um, it's so easy to, to develop an ego and it's so easy to want to approach things from a place of authority. And it's amazing how much you stop learning as soon as it happens. Yeah. It's also interesting. I, I remember, you know, two years into our work in Uganda, um, noticing some inefficiencies, but constantly being told by our director of Uganda operations, um, and the, the wider team, look, this is how things are done here. So just like, that's the culture. And then when we started doing some work in India, um, noticing some differences, and some of them were the way that the teachers and, and students were interacting, others were the way that the teachers were were being trained and realizing, hey, you know what? There's actually this experience and seeing how it's done in India um, has actually shown me that objectively there are th there are efficiencies that can be brought over to improve student learning outcomes. And so I, I love what you're saying about, you know, being being more objective and the fact that you're not from South Africa actually in some respects works in your favor. Yeah. Yeah, it is It is hard though, um, combating tradition or, you know, policies or customs that have been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I think some of the times that I've struggled in South Africa where I've had the greatest challenge is when I am dealing with an older South African male. Mm. Um, and many times you'll, you'll hit a brick wall there. And so sometimes, Sometimes it's about recognizing like what you can change and 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 what you can't, um, and also maybe recognizing that sometimes me being the leader and negotiator in this scenario is not correct, and maybe we need to get someone else into the room to have a conversation on a same on a level playing field. And I think sometimes what I've learned, especially in this role, is. Um, when it comes to empowering others or making change or leading, sometimes the best way to lead is to get the heck out of the way and let someone else do it. <laughs> um, and being and being okay with that. I mean, yeah, I think there's only there's only so much that I can do. Um, and it's been fun to do that, to be honest. One of the re I mean, I, this is the first time I've ever led a team. And yes, my team is small, but. Like we have so many partners, we have a board, we have schools. And so in many ways, like I am pushing forward on, on behalf of all of this. And it definitely is a new role for me. But one of the fun things that I've enjoyed is being able to decide like, okay, this in this situation, I'm not the correct person to do it. Please, you know, my program manager or someone else, please someone else jump in and, and you know, take the lead here because you're better equipped to do it than I am. Um, and I, <laughs> and that's okay, right? Like yes. you hide your team because they fill gaps. They fill gaps, and they, you know, um, they have qualities that you don't, and that's how you balance everyone together. But it's nice to be able to have the uh, make the executive decision to say, I do not want to be the executive in this situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, learning to delegate. It's a it's a fascinating one. <laughs> so in in the Bromfisher. Uh, elementary schools are, are you building 
computer labs in them? So as of right now, um, we are not, not this year at least. Um, the focus this year was to uh, work with our three secondary schools but what we've started doing in the primary schools, um, we are committed to improving infrastructure. And we're doing that through our partnership with an organization called Youth Build South Africa, um, where we have recruited 100 unemployed young people between the ages of 18. And I think the oldest one is maybe around 30. Um, over, it's a 12 month program. Those 100 people gain skills in construction and uh, then they'll be deployed to those schools in Brom Fisher and will either improve those school assets. And we are building a brand new community hall um, at, at Siobonga Secondary in Brom Fisher. So, so yeah, so that's how we are going about solving our, our infrastructure goal. Um, but at the primary school, some of them are, already have computer labs. There are various programs within the government. Some of the uh, grade eight or grade seven classrooms already have labs. So next year, what we're gonna pick up on are um, programs to improve literacy and maths at the primary level, to improve foundational skills before they get to secondary. And luckily, because some of them already have labs, we'll work with organizations that incorporate technology into advancing um, literacy and math. So beautiful to hear. Something that I'm wondering about is what, what is actually the, the genesis story behind the Trevor Noah Foundation? What, what was the why? Why was the organization founded to begin with? Yeah. Uh, well, if you know Trevor's book and Trevor's story, yeah. if you've read On the Crime, you know, I think he really attributes his success today to the fact that, number one, he received a good education. Mm -hmm. um, and number two, the fact that he had a positive role model in his life, being his mom, Patricia. And so those two factors, I think he recognizes, you know, that many kids don't have that, whether it's a strong family member that can help guide and, you know, teach them things that the classroom doesn't. I think there's a really good quote in his book that says, you know, his mom taught him what schools did and they taught him how to think you know, critically um, to be able to visualize dreams and to expose him to what's possible. And then obviously second, a, a good education. I think Trevor went to some, you know, private schools around the area. And I mean, as we know, not all schools are created equal. So for, the, for him, those were the two driving factors to say, no, you know, education is where I want to put my money. Um, education is where I want to have influence. And so, yeah, that's kind of like the foundation of what started us. Amazing. You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I have read Born a Crime and I absolutely loved it. I, I thought it was such a beautiful book. And on top of that, he, I love how deeply he goes into the history of the people and just the amazing foundation that he provides the, the reader with in terms of why South Africa is the way that it is and what lack of, what lack of education can do to a population. And yeah, I, I was blown away and, and deeply inspired by the book. You know, that book resonates with so many people. Um, I mean, we get so many emails from people all around the world, from people living in like rural India or rural Nepal who email us all the time, just talking about how deeply born and crime resonates with them in some way. And I mean, we use that book in various forms. Um, we recently had a, a workshop for our a representative council of learners who is basically student leadership at the schools. Um, and we extracted a, a chapter from Born a Crime and we talked about it. And I think the chapter talked about um, diversity and um, you know creative ways to improve schools. I think it shared the, the tuck shop story of how he went around and started becoming the middleman between people at school and the tuck shop to earn a little bit of money. So kind of like trying to instill some of that creative and hustler mindset of, you know, what are some of the ways that we could creatively think about, um, you know, either fundraising for the school or, you know, um, we've taken that books to our uh, orphanages, so our CYCCs, child youth care centers, they're called, um, on, on Mandela Day a few years ago. And we had book readings and we distributed books to some of the homes. And I think just how he talks about diversity being an asset, how understanding and speaking different languages are an asset, 
um, I think that kind of thinking is helpful for some of our students to understand. Um, because when English isn't your first language, I mean, confidence le levels can be quite low, right? Mm -hmm. So just to flip it on its head and say, no, actually, you know, because you learn, you understand three or four different languages, um, it's actually a great thing. It can help you get ahead at life. And here are some ways that it helps me get ahead at life. Um, so yeah, so we use that book a lot as a reference and, and, and as a, um, a place where students can feel comfortable and, and connected to the work that we do and obviously to Trevor. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that. It, it's, it's a beautiful book. And if folks haven't listened, uh, haven't, they can listen to it on Audible or they can read mm -hmm. it. And either way, I cannot recommend a, a book more strongly right now. When you think about, you know, the next few years ahead, what, what excites you most about the opportunity that you've been given and arguably the obligation that you have, what, 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 kind, of, what kind of areas of the organization um, or initiatives excite you the most? Yeah. Yeah, so since we started, I think we've taken a very micro level um, in terms of how we improve educational impacts on the lives of learners, right? Started with one school. Um, and then we've kind of scaled to say, okay, how does that one school translate in relation to the community. Um, and now with our YALI program, which I didn't talk about that much, uh, trains and empowers teachers to think innovatively and more like an entrepreneur to influence learning outcomes in their classrooms and communities. And our first cohort we ran last year um, included 50 young educators representing 13 Southern African countries. So now we're already starting to have a more of a global view of not just what's happening in South Africa, but in Southern Africa. Um, and I think for me, what's next is taking a further step back and thinking about how the foundation can strengthen the educational ecosystem in South Africa or Southern Africa. Um, and I'm already seeing this pipeline being developed where you know, ideas that come out of the program that we have with YALI is called Education Change Makers. So some of those teachers actually have ideas with commercial potential or viability. So, you know, same as you would through any entrepreneurial program, at the end, we ask our teachers to pitch an idea for how they would improve education in their classrooms and communities. And the top 10 ideas get a small micro grant um, and a coach for about six months. So we're actually asking them to turn their ideas into practical either businesses or projects on the ground. Um, but with those ideas, I then see a space where we could use our Kulani Schools program or network as like a testing ground. We can test ideas, we can uh, create focus groups, we can uh, pilot projects and interventions coming out of education change makers. And then the next step for me really wants to look at impact investing for the foundation. So, you know, education isn't, an, isn't an, a sector where a lot of investment is, is readily available, maybe for ed tech, um, but that's kind of the only area. And so with the foundation's name and brand, can we strengthen the ecosystem so that from idea to piloting to investing in and potentially scaling, can the foundation be helpful in, uh, in improving education that way? Um, again, being forward thinking and being innovative there are a lot of ideas that come out of South Africa. Um, and it, yeah, can we be the people to help those I turn those ideas into reality? What, what can our listeners do right now to support the Trevor Noah Foundation and its vision? I mean, to learn more about us specifically, you can go to our website, www.trevernoahfoundation.org with foundation all spelled out. Uh, we're very active on social media, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, we post often, we share impact stories, like I mentioned earlier, and we love engagement there. We also love new ideas. We want to hear what you're doing, whether in South Africa or around the world. Um, but I think, you know, to contribute to our vision, like, we know that education is um, complex and, and challenging around the world. So, I mean, you know, I think everyone has a role to play in improving education. It's an issue that touches all of us because you know we all went through some kind of educational system. Um, so I mean, so whether you're contributing to our foundation or not, like it's not super important to, to me, but I just you know encourage people to think about what your role is in improving 
or you know impacting an educational system close to you it could be the one you attended it could be the community that you live in um but yeah i definitely think everyone has a role to play when it comes to improving education very well put i'm with you shalane thank you thank you so much for the opportunity and i had a lot of fun Thank you for listening to Impact in the 21st Century, and thank you to RBC for sponsoring this episode. We're so grateful for your sponsorship, which helps Simbi Foundation further our mission to support the next 3.5 million learners in refugee settlements. So how do we do this? We collaborate with the UN and incredible partner communities to build solar power classrooms called Bright Boxes. You can learn more at simbifoundation.org. If you enjoyed this episode and think a family member, friend, or coworker would also enjoy it, feel free to share. A personal message goes a long way and will allow us to invite more awesome guests to join for the positive impact conversation. But the conversation doesn't end here, and I'd love for you to join the discussion. So please subscribe, leave a review, comment, and let us know what you thought of today's episode, or if there's anyone else you'd like to see on the podcast. In the meantime, wishing you a wonderful, impactful day ahead, and be sure to join for the next episode.